Thank you very much. Right, um, if I could just start actually by saying thanks to Ian. This, this all started, this is the third edition of my hipster dictionary. It started out in the year 2000. I came up with the idea, pitched it at Ian with, I think, what, just a few definitions and the idea for the book. And uh, God bless him, he said yes to it, and uh, it did it did nicely, and then we did another edition in the year 2000, and that was bigger. And now we've done a much, much bigger edition. This has got an awful lot more entries in it, and crucially, it's got a lot of the pictures that you can see around the walls. It's got 200 pictures in it uh, this time. Um, but the idea is basically the same, and that comes from... I've been buying uh, books like this, pulp, uh, pulp fiction, and listening to uh, old blues, rockabilly, country records for 30 or 40 years, uh, watching film noir, that sort of thing. And it struck me that people used the same language. This language crosses these boundaries. Usually if you buy a book about film, you buy a book about music, the history of music, then it tends to confine itself to the music uh, or about crime fiction. Uh, whereas Louis Armstrong, for instance, in the 20s, when he was at absolutely the forefront of hip and, jazz, and the jazz language, he would use a word in the title of a jazz song and the mobsters in Chicago during Prohibition, they were using that, so the underworld were using the same words, and then Hollywood would pick up on that, they'd pick up on a book like Little Caesar, we've got the cover somewhere down there, uh, which was a book written in Chicago while Capone was running Chicago, and was then immediately made into a film, uh, so suddenly it's on the big screen, and Hollywood is so powerful then, you've got words just you were hearing them on the radio in the songs, but you were also then seeing them at the cinema. And some of these words were really quite strange. You do need an explanation, but you don't necessarily need to understand them to enjoy the public enemy, for instance. Jimmy Cagney, you've got his place of business, and it's absolutely trashed. It's been blown up a couple of times. And he goes, yeah, three pineapples thrown at us in the last two days. Pineapples, that's a hand grenade. And that's very common, that's underworld slang. But you don't need to know that. Or in, in a lot of those films, uh, people pull out a Roscoe, or a heater, or a gat. That's a gun. Raymond Chandler's using that. He, he uses the, uh, the phrase, all right, Dad, shed the heater. It means drop your gun. But you don't need to know that to... You go with the, uh, you go with the story, you understand what it means. But these are... It, just, it struck me it would be fun to put them all together and say, OK, this is what it meant in the 20s or in the 40s. Uh, and here's some, crucially, here's some examples. So hopefully to point people in the direction, if you like Chandler, if you like Hammett, then why not read um, Jonathan Latimer? Why not read Howard Brown? The sort of people who are also using that sort of thing. But I was then drawn into using the absolute under-the-counter film, quite honestly, the lust teasers. No one has ever been nominate this for the Booker Prize. Or my favourite over here, Sex Atlantic Pilot. This <laughs> one was on only one thing and it wasn't the controls. Um, <laughs> on the back here, this, this published in the early 60s, and this was supposed to give people a thrill, this, again, under the counter, but it says, um, his, his, his exclusive Mile High Sex Club and his flight plan, flight plan frails. Frails is the key word there. Slang term for women. If you think Cab Calloway, Many the moocher, and moocher, by the way, that's a hipster term as well. Um, but he goes, uh, many, uh, many was the roughest, toughest frail. She had a heart as big as a well. Frail, a woman. So that mainstream big hit in uh, what, about 1930, 31. But you wouldn't necessarily, if you stop lots of people who've been buying jazz records all their life, and say, oh, what does frail mean then? They wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you. Come back to Louis Armstrong. Around about 1925, one of his big hits with the Hot Five, which was pretty much the hippest jazz outfit in the world at that time, they did a, a song called Strutting with Some Barbecue. <laughs> now, my mum's long-term man, lovely gentleman called Jeffrey, he's been a Louis Armstrong fan since the 30s. He'd loved that song all his life. He saw Louis Armstrong in the 50s when Armstrong came over here. Um, it wasn't until I told him what struggling with some barbecue meant that it, it even really occurred to me, 
Excuse me. Why is the finest jazz trumpeter that ever lived walking around with an item of alfresco? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we break the if we break the sentence down, strutting. It's a dance. The strut was one of the hip dances of the 1920s. So you are doing a dance with some barbecue. A barbecue is a good-looking woman. It's the best-looking woman in a room. And this is relatively smarty. It just means good enough to eat a barbecue. So <laughs> 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 I apologise. There's so much filth in my room. I, in my room. <laughs> Strut with some barbecue means I am dancing with the best looking woman uh, in the room. 